Are you ready for another episode of The Horror Guys? Yay! I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm Kevin. I'm Brian. And we're ready. We are ready. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of new films this week. It might be a short podcast because we don't start, we don't spoil the, the new ones as much. We aren't going to spoil the heck out of them, but you can read all about them. Yep. Where can they read all about them? Horrorweekly.com. Horrorweekly.com. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the regular full-length movies are not going on HorrorGuys.com anymore. The HorrorGuys.com is just for shorts. Okay. Horror Weekly is where we get all the full-length movies. All right. And the shorts. You get everything on Horror Weekly. Okay. We've yeah. got it all at Horror Weekly. Stop in today. HorrorWeekly.com. Ding. Ding. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those things where the guy's t- tooth shines bright, you know? Uh, uh-huh. No cliches here. <laughs> and, of course, check out HorrorMonthly.com, which sometime this weekend, actually probably Monday, the what is that, the second or something like that, mm-hmm. the new issue will be out, which contains everything we did in August. And we'll tell you what our favorites were for the month. There was a lot of good stuff. Yeah, there was. A few crappers, but mostly good. Mostly good this month, yeah. yeah. And we got a mostly good week, too. We do. We got a bunch of new stuff. What do we got? Oh, we got Long Legs. Heard a lot about that one. Oh, I'm very hyped. And, you know, for the longest time, I hadn't heard a single thing about it. I just, thought it was a spider. The title. We both thought it was a spider movie. <laughs> totally thought it was about spiders. <laughs> it's not about spiders. Giant mutant spiders, no. Uh, Oddity, another brand new one. And uh, that's the same guy that brought you a caveat, if you remember that one. Did not like caveat. Oh, I liked that one quite a bit. Well, it was one of those black-on-black movies, and... Mm. Our TV wasn't up to snuff at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, Tuesday, which was an interesting movie, but really pushing it to call it horror. And Handling the Undead, which was definitely horror. And Was it, though? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And You'll Never Find Me. And a whole bunch of short films. Yeah. So all five of our main movies this week are newish Brand ones. New ones. Yeah, just yeah. released this well, year. Well, newish, yeah. Yeah. And if you missed the announcement last week, we did do a special, special episode for exclusive for the paid people only. All about the prophecy movies. Christopher Walken prophecy. There were five of them and they were all pretty good. He was in the first three and yeah. then they kind of rebooted sort on the second two. But they all had good cast. They had Tony Todd and I always forget the pinhead guy. Pinhead. Doug Bradley. Doug Bradley, yes, yes. Yeah, uh-huh. and, and a, a bunch lot, of other people. A lot of recognizable faces, oh, yeah. especially the first one. Yeah, especially, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, you go over to horrorweekly.com, and there's a button there to subscribe. It's, I think it's $5 a month or $50 for the year. That doesn't sound bad. And every month we're going to put out a bonus newsletter, bonus podcast, and maybe some short stories coming up soon. We, maybe, maybe. We're discussing that. Uh-huh. If you're interested in hearing, reading some of our stories... Send us an email. Email at horrorguys.com. Ding. Ding. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of get a little bell. (laughs) All right. So anyway, yeah, there's that bonus thing available. Horror Monthly is coming up early next week. And if you've been watching anything, any kind of horror media, any kind of horror group on the internet, you have heard a ton of hype about long legs. Some people like it. Some people hate it. Some people haven't seen it, some have. I like the commercial where um, Mike Monroe, the, the star of the movie, is sitting there, and they reveal Nicolas Cage's makeup for the first time. And she's like, ah! It's really not that bad. It's really not. No. He's kind of, he's kind of ghastly. <laughs> it's looking. interesting, but it's not that impressive. And I was impressed, though, how I did not recognize Nicolas Cage. I mean, usually it's in a in a movie. It's if you know it's him, you know it's him. Nicholas Cage shows up and does Nicholas Cage. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was distinctly different this time around between his mannerisms. He was and still being Cage. His look and his voice, but yeah, he was in good disguise. I liked it. I liked him in this, although he really was not in it very much. I bet he didn't get more than five minutes of screen time. Oh, more, well, more than five, way more than five. But not a lot. A 10 second thing it's, in the beginning, it's a more, videotape later. It's more about not makeup. A lot. Make yeah, up. it's more about her. Yeah, yeah making my own. Okay, Long Legs, 2024, written by Osgood Perkins and directed also. Stars Mika Monroe, Nicolas Cage, and Blair Underwood. One hour and 41 minutes. Trailer in the show notes. And I'm just going to start out with saying this is my favorite of the week. Is it? Yes, it is. Oh, I didn't think that far ahead. Let's see, we got Oddity, Tuesday, Handling the Undead, You'll Never Catch Me. 
good stuff, but this was my fave. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's a hard one this week, but mm. yeah. yeah, I'll go with Long Legs also. It was. I don't think it was the best movie of the year, but I was entertained. I did like it. I think it's the best of the week. Mm-hmm. For sure. A lot of people really like an oddity, which... I didn't like as much as Long Legs. It was... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, spoiler-free, what happens? Well, imagine taking the vibe of Silence of the Lambs. And that is the perfect comparison. This is mm-hmm. Silence of the Lambs with some supernatural stuff thrown in. Yeah. Yep, very much so. Uh, a Clary Starling type of yeah. FBI agent, kind of semi-solo, working on a case that's weird. And mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you add some supernatural elements and dial up the horror to full volume, and you'd get this movie. It's really well made with a retro look and excellent performances all around, especially from Mika Monroe in the lead and a pretty unrecognizable Nicolas Cage. We both liked it a lot. Yeah. And we have Must be morning. It's all our announcements are going (laughs) off. (laughs) Disregard those. So tell us, give us a little bit of a taste. Well, we open on a young girl looking out at a car in the snow. She goes outside and meets a strange man with a white face who says he wore his long legs today. Credits roll. And you don't get to see his face very clearly at first. Just to sort of his and, chin. And there are a couple of times where you just get a quick flash of his face. And just, there's nothing special about his legs. No, no. And this is the only time the, just, the long legs even gets mentioned in the story. He's, he's, he's just, just, he's just something weird, weird, he says. He's, he's very weird, yeah. Well, okay, we cut to the 1990s, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is very vague on the time frames. It is, yeah. 1990s, they had the computers. They had, uh, depending on the year the internet was around, they certainly had computers to look things up. You don't see anything like that here. Very low tech. If uh, if they didn't have a picture of Bill Clinton on the wall at the FBI, I would have guessed it was took place in the 70s. Mm-hmm. But they give it away with that. Yeah. yeah. Well, we cut to a bunch of FBI agents being briefed about a door-to-door search for their suspect, who is expected to be armed and dangerous. Agent Lee Harker waits in the car for Agent Fisk to start knocking on doors. She's like a trainee, and he's like the experienced guy. Mm-hmm. So he, he's taking charge. She gets a feeling about one of those houses and wants to call it in. Fisk isn't about to call in reinforcements because she has a hunch. Turns out she was right, and then the guy inside shoots Fisk in the head, boom, right out of the blue. Boom, yeah. Lee goes inside and arrests the man indoors. Afterwards, she undergoes a strange psychological test. Could she be psychic? She's at least very highly intuitive. She knew where the murderer was, and she shouldn't have known these things. And it's some kind of weird number-guessing thing where she scores way higher than normal, too. The, The slides, the test she gets is very weird, but... She scores super That was high a weird it. test. I didn't yeah. get that a whole lot of thought afterwards, but yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, there really wasn't enough information for normal people to go on, but she was getting it right more than, you know, more than a typical person would. Agent, yeah. Agent Carter, the guy in charge, takes Lee and Agent Browning to the house of a man who killed his entire family. They find a strange handwritten note in code signed Long Legs, and Carter suspects that this person somehow made the father kill his family. The father d- it clearly did the killing, yeah, but this long-legs guy seems to have been behind it somehow. They're murder-suicides. Yeah. Multiple, multiple times this has happened. There have been ten the dad, families done this way. Yeah, the dad seems to go insane and kills the family and then himself, but... There's always a long-legs There's always note. a long-legs note, yeah. Yeah, and he didn't do it... Long-legs didn't kill anybody directly himself. But Carter wants to know how Lee knew that that house held the murderer... And he thinks she's psychic and wants to use her to figure out the long legs case. Well, at least to restart, Lee starts researching the 10 cases of fathers murdering their families, and Carter makes Lee come inside to meet his wife, Anna, and daughter, Ruby. Lee goes home and calls her mother, Ruth, who used to be a nurse. There's a knock on her door, and she sees someone standing outside in the woods. She goes outside and sees him indoors. He's gone into her house. The person inside leaves her a note. Do not open till January 14th. Well, she opens it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a birthday card inside with coded words inside using long legs as code. Hmm. Ruby's birth, little Ruby's birthday party is coming up soon. And she immediately knows how to decode the message. And sure enough, it's a threat. In the morning, she gets called to another one of the family, family murders. This one happened a month ago and they just found the bodies. Yum. It's a mess. Yeah, it is. Those are gross. 
All right, and we'll probably stop there. It's a detective story, basically. Yeah, the case unfolds with more and more clues being discovered and manipulations and discoveries, and yeah. It's a detective story about a serial killer and the detective who chases him down. It's, it's like si- very much like Silence of the Lambs. With more supernatural stuff to it. And I'm not seeing that many people make that comparison. No, I which haven't. It seems kind of obvious. Yeah, I thought so. Well, yeah. th- this is another one of those retro kind of films. There's been a lot of those this year. Mm-hmm. This, ta- this one takes place in the 90s, we assume, because Bill Clinton's hanging on the wall. But most of the visuals make it look more like the 70s. Everything's sort of washed down and orange like a Burger King commercial. Yeah, somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the acting is good all around, with Micah Monroe playing Agent Lee as mildly autistic, spitting out numbers and facts and decoding the letters very quickly. But she's not very comfortable around people, which kind of makes her interesting. Blair Underwood, as Carter, is a good manager. Yeah, usually the, the, the guy in charge is either stupid, arrogant, in on it, or otherwise an antagonist. But he's very supportive and knows what her abilities are and uses them. Well, and that's another thing I think it had in common with Silence of the Lambs, too. Her boss was, uh-huh. her boss was a really smart, good guy. Yeah, and Nicholas Cage here, as you said, is almost unrecognizable and is definitely at peak weird here. Nicholas Cage gets weird in a lot of movies, but he's very weird, weird in this one. Yes, over-the-top weird, yeah. Yeah. It's slow getting started, but it is very good. As we've said several times, it's sort of a, a horror, hor- horrific turn on Silence of the Lambs. And despite the title, there is a real lack of spiders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad I went into it blind. No. I don't think I don't know if I would have known it was Nicolas Cage if I didn't know it was Nicolas Cage. I really do, had a hard time picking him out. I was spoiled as to what he looked like because after that trailer, I wanted to see what he looked like, and oh. I got spoiled. But I, I didn't know. I, I was blind also. Yeah. Yeah. Good one. Yeah. Would highly recommend. Well, if you're looking for a detective mystery story. Yeah. If you're looking for serial killer, slasher, Jason, Freddy, no. No. Or giant spiders. Or yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> Very few spiders. <laughs> Oddity, 2024, directed and written by Damian McCarthy. And it's not McCarthy the usual way. It's Mick Space Carthy. Okay. <laughs> it's very strange spelling. Okay. Stars Carolyn Bracken, Johnny French, and Steve Ball. Hour and 38 minutes, trailer in the show notes. I think this is a Shudder original. Okay. Spoiler free. It was well made, strange, and interesting. Carolyn Bracken was very good playing twin sisters, and the settings and props are cool. If I didn't know the credits, I wouldn't have known that they were the same actress. Yeah, they. she's she's good. Yeah, really good. The, yeah, the settings and the props here are, as you said, are cool. They're, they're, they're really kind of the movie. It takes place in this weird old, like, is it it's a fort? It's like a miniature fort. They, yeah. they, they, uh-huh. They're rebuilding as a house. A fortress house kind of thing. And the prop is this wooden man thing that is really good. A life-size, creepy wooden statue. Yeah, it almost felt like Doll. there were, yeah. almost felt like there were going to be some surprises, but everything happened kind of the way we expected it would. We give it a moderate thumbs up. Yeah. It's very like well to, made, but there are very few real surprises here. Yeah, I, I, as things happened, I thought, oh, of course that happened. <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, not that that's bad necessarily. But, There's some yeah. twists, I guess, but yeah. they're not real surprising twists. I didn't think so. No. Yeah. Okay, well, well, give us a taste. We open at a mental hospital where Ted, a doctor, gets a call from Danny, who is working on an, restoring an old house in the country. She wants to invite her sister, Darcy, for dinner tomorrow night. Well, she's alone in the ancient house. Olin, a creepy man with one eye. He's a very creepy man with one eye. Mm-hmm. He comes to the door, peeps in through the, the big old uh, peephole thing, says someone has sneaked inside with her. He's one of her husband's former mental patients, but he swears he's trying to help her. When she threatens to call the police, he tells her, yeah, do that. But she's lost her phone. Well, she hears noises and starts to wonder if the man is telling the truth. She reaches for the door handle. Is she going to let him in? Don't know because credits Credits roll. roll. Did she or didn't she? Well, we cut to Declan. Another Declan. Declan. Declan, yes. Another one of the mental patients who is a good artist and living in a halfway house. He has many sketches of the one-eyed man we saw outside Danny's house because they're roomies. Well, something out in this hallway terrifies him, and he finds Olin head-crushed. 
Well, he picks up the eye, which has been laying on the ground. <laughs> the, the, yeah, he, he's the got glass a glass eye. eye yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the actor really does. I, I, I looked that up. The actor really lost an eye. Not in the movie. He <laughs> not, <laughs> it looks yeah, a little not, high a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Well, Ted goes to visit Darcy, Danny's blind sister, who runs an antique shop, Odello's Odyssey, Oddities, that has items that she says are haunted and cursed. She shows Ted a cursed bell, claiming that if it's rung, the furious ghost of a bellhop will appear. Ted is skeptical. Yeah, but she very carefully puts it away without ringing it. And uh, Ted says he has something. Declan has died, and they found it among his possessions. Darcy was asking for it, and she wants to examine it. So it's been a year since Danny's murder. Ted's got a new girlfriend, Yana. And the two of them are living in that old house now. Okay, so hmm. the wife and sister has been killed. The husband has got a new girlfriend, and the sister wants the murderer's eye. Mm -hmm. Weird. Yeah. Well, Darcy goes home, and we see that she now has Olin's weird glass eye. She uses her psychic ability to see what he saw. She, she can hold objects and uh, get a sense of the person that they belonged to. Well, Ted talks to Yana, who found Danny's old camera. There are photos of Danny on the camera, which uh, Yana took two days ago. Yana's been seeing things in the old house, so could Danny be haunting them? Well, it turns out Darcy had a locked crate delivered, and then she just shows up to visit, which is awkward with Yana there. And I thought that was weird with Darcy. I mean, she clearly is completely blind, stone blind. She can't drive, mm -hmm. and she's just there outside. Well, I assume she had somebody drop get her a, off. Get an Uber, and, you know, and they, they were long gone. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. Here I am. <laughs> Hopefully, good thing they were home. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ted has to go to work, and Yana has an, had enough of the creepy house and was planning on going to the city for the night. So Darcy says, uh, can I stay there alone? I'll just stay here while you're gone. And they reluctantly agree to it. Well, Darcy unlocks the crate, and Ted and Yana are confused by its contents. It's some kind of wooden doll man with a very creepy face. Well, Ted goes to work, looks at Declan's file. It's full of drawings that look like the wooden man in the box. Yeah, and that's probably the good stopping point. Probably is. Yeah. It's a very weird movie. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a short film, How Olin Lost His Eye. If you go to our article there, there's a link to it on YouTube. That was the basis of this film. And really, it's about how this little kid loses an eye. It's not really related. No, but it's interesting. But one of Darcy's oddities is the ugly rabbit from Caveat. I, I recognize that. that right off the bat. Mm -hmm. uh, wooden Man is a very cool-looking cool prop. The bell thing felt a little bit random, like it just needed something else in there for some closure. But were all the things in Darcy's shop really cursed? Remember Friday the 13th, the series? I don't think all the things were. I noticed one, sh one shot she had <clears throat> some special lit shelves on the wall. Mm -hmm. And that's where the bell was and some other things. It was the rabbit there, I assume? Yeah, the rabbit uh -huh. was there. I think those were the cursed things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that fortress house that they lived in was awesome. Yeah. And, and I thought the cast was excellent, especially the, the lead where she's playing twins. Yeah. Thought it was very good. Not quite great, but good. Good, real good. All right. Yeah, liked it yeah. a lot. What day is it? I don't know. <laughs> Somewhere around Tuesday? Oh, it could be. It oh, could it. be. Yeah, our next two films are kind of sketchy on the horror front. Low-key horror. Yeah, I've heard people argue against both of them even being horror. Uh, well, the first one is probably uh, the most arguable, Tuesday from 2024. For sure. I mean, handling the undead, I think, was definitely horror. Yeah, it's, it's arguable also, though. Okay. Uh, the Tuesday, uh, written and directed by Dana Oniunas Pusik. We had some trouble with Tuesday and finding it on IMDb because it actually was made in 2023 and released in 2024. And there's been several other movies called Tuesday in 2024. So it's a little harder maybe to find. Look for maybe the actors. Yeah, Julia yeah. Louis-Dreyfus from uh, Seinfeld. And other things. Yeah. And uh, pre uh, Veep. Veep and yeah. many other things. Yeah. Lola Pettigrew and Leah Harvey, hour and 50 minutes. Maybe a little longer than it needed to be. Maybe. It, it, it was good. Trailer in the show notes. 
And yeah, what do you? It's spoiler free. Well, to call it horror is pushing it, like we said, but it does have a massive body count. Death is personified, appearing to a dying woman and her mother. But things get more complicated than that as death is delayed from his task. So it's a good philosophical what if kind of fantasy movie that get, it keeps a tight focus on four characters. And it was quite good. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely not a horror movie. Not really. Not really. It's got death. Yeah. Death persona. I think death is a, always a cool character when death shows up. Yeah, and uh, it, and and you can you can guess. You know, I mean, if death is here not doing his job, things are not dying. You've probably seen so, that in movies before. Yeah, yeah. Which death I, gets locked up. But or I something. thought that was cool because you really just see it around the fringes of the movie in the background. Where the world is falling apart. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't really see it, but they definitely but hint at it. Yeah, and and this is you know the four characters and death. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so again, this is probably more psychological drama and fantasy, and with fantasy, yeah, yeah, yeah. cosmic, you know, big big ideas kind of thing. Yeah. We get a shot of Earth from space, and then zoom out to see a weird looking bird asleep on someone's eye. The weird bird then flies away, grows huge, and confronts a woman in the parking lot. The bird waves his wing, and the woman dies. He then flies to an old woman and does the same thing to her. He then hears a man say, I'm not dying, as he bleeds out. The bird gets him too. This bird is death incarnate. Uh huh. It's a parrot. Yeah. <laughs> We cut to Zora, who is tiptoeing around the house to keep from disturbing Tuesday, her daughter. So Tuesday's not the day of the week, it's a character. It's her name. And Tuesday is homesick in a hospital bed. Zora goes to a taxidermy shop to sell a set of stuffed pontifical rats. These are little rats dressed up like the Pope and bishops. Mm-hmm. In various religious poses. Yeah. And it's kind of a funny <laughs> and scene. And she's trying to sell him as a set. He, he just wants to buy like one or two. And she's like, no, it's a set. And she ex- explains why they're a set. <laughs> and, yeah. But basically she needs the money because she's going broke. Yeah, you see glimpses of her comedy chops here, but mostly it's serious. Yeah, it, it's yeah. got some funny bits, but it's definitely not a comedy. Uh-huh. Well, Tuesday is at home talking with Nurse Billy. Tuesday starts breathing funny, and elsewhere, elsewhere, the magic bird perks up. Ooh, got another one. Yep. The bird comes to collect Tuesday, but stops when the girl starts telling him a story about one of the neighbors. The bird of death laughs at Tuesday's joke. Suddenly, there's some loud music, and the bird shrinks. She picks him up and tells him he's had a panic attack. So she's not afraid of death. She talk, tells him a joke and then helps him through a panic attack. Death has a panic Death attack? having panic, panic attacks, yeah. <laughs> well, the bird has glue on his foot, and when Tuesday offers to wash him, he says, I'm filthy. Yes, the bird can talk. I haven't spoken in a long time. Well, she helps Death wash the filth off, and he hugs her afterwards. Not the hug of Death, the real kind. Mm-hmm. She knows what he's there to do, but asks to phone her mother first. When Zora doesn't pick up, Death gets angry. He talks about hearing everyone's pain forever. And then the two of them sing a rap song and then vape together. And he's happy because for the first time when he's, or at least the first time in a long time, uh, it's like a a steady buzz of voices. And when he's with her, he's not hearing the voices. Was that explained why not? Well, no, it wasn't really. Okay. Yeah, for some reason. She's special. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. And so he hangs around with her for a while. Yeah, and that's as far as we're going to go. Yeah. This one was listed in several places as a horror film, but it's more of a magical fantasy about death, lowercase d, so it probably fits into horror somewhere around the very edges. There's a a large creature who kills a lot of people, so there's that. Well, he's large when he wants to be and teeny when he wants to be. Yeah, he's a size changer. Uh But it's definitely not really a horror film. It's not scary. There have been many other films in the past where death takes a holiday, death is taken prisoner, or otherwise put out of action for a while, and the situation always goes the same way. Death here is obviously part part, part puppet and part CGI, but he's done really well. There aren't a lot of special effects here other than him, but what we do see are well done. There's some size-changing jokes in here as well, and it's all good. Mm -hmm. There's a few gore effects here and there. There's a lot here that deals with dying and grief and dealing with both. 
Why do people die? Why are we here? What good is a parent without their child? It's definitely a dying child parent kind of story. Which sounds like fun, doesn't it? Well, that's the thing. It's not a happy <laughs> It's not a fun movie. It's not a happy movie, but it is nice and it's very moving. Yeah. yeah. It's more but philosophical than horrific, but it was still a good movie. Just don't expect to be scared. Yeah. Yeah. I, w- I, I would say I liked it and would recommend it. Would you call it a tearjerker? Uh, for many people, it would be. It yes. probably probably for some, yeah. Yeah, it, we're we're hardened. We, we have we have we have kill hard, them quicker, we, kill them quicker. We have hard black shells, and you know, we, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it would be for many people. All right. Well, the next one is uh, also on the fringe of horror, but it's a zombie movie, so it's a, it's, it's a little movie. more further over the line than Tuesday it's was. Definitely horror. Handling the Undead, 2024, directed by Thea Havistendahl, and written by Thea Havistendahl and John Ajvidi Lindqvist. You might I love the, these Norwegian names. You might get the impression that it's not an American film. It stars <laughs> Bjorn Sundqvist, Renata Rinsve, and Dennis Ostry Rud. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's <laughs> uh, subtitled, but it's worth the read. It was subtitled. I almost yeah. almost forgot about it. It's so subtle. It's mm-hmm. yeah, it, yeah. Hour and 37 minutes, trailer in the show notes. If you hate subtitled movies, you may want to give this one a try anyway. The subtitles did not lose did not me in this one. Us, yeah. Sp- Spoiler free? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, this was a super slow moving movie. But it definitely was. We were not bored by it. No. No. The freshly dead come back, but the focus is on three family units and how they are experiencing it. Kind of with the rest of the world in the background, like like we mentioned in the previous movie, and rather than it being a high action zombie apocalypse, deals more of a realistic fashion with what it would be like for those people. You know, you you see somebody you deeply care about, and they come back as a kind of they're alive, but not quite because they're all zombified. Um, reviews are mixed, but we liked it a lot. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going into this expecting World War Z or, you know, Walking Dead or that kind of zombie movie. This is a zombie drama. Yeah. and it What does, would real it life be bad. like if this sort of happened on a low scale? Yeah. I think this and Tuesday are probably like, meanwhile, across town, mm-hmm. the dead are getting back up. <laughs> yeah. This is the second half of Tuesday. Uh-huh. All right. Well, anyway, no, well, not really. And, and I think it, it, you know, it deals with grief and loss. Uh, uh-huh. uh, there's an older woman that uh, clearly they were a lesbian couple, mm-hmm. and she, she, her partner dies, and then comes back. You know, and so she deal with that. You, know, you can't move on. You know, she's there, but yet not there. And, and the other one is a full family, and the mother dies. The mother dies, comes but back. not dies, and so they're stuck in limbo, not knowing what's going on. And the third one is a family where the little kid dies and comes back. Yeah. So you get a taste of three different situations. Yeah. And these are not, you know, brain-eating monsters. These are just dead well, people who are sort of back. Yeah, yeah. Well, an old man sits and smokes, packs a lunch, and goes for a walk. He goes into a building, but has to take the stairs when the elevator doesn't work. I expected him to die before he got to the top, but that didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen. Old man Mailer arrives at Anna's apartment, and they don't say much. She doesn't want the food that he brought her, and she basically ignores him and leaves. We don't know what's up with that. But then Mailer cleans up her apartment and puts toys back where they belong. But there's no children here. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, Oh, sort of get a hint what happened here. There's a child that died, yeah. Well, we cut to Tora, an old woman, at her elderly friend's funeral. She's the only one there, and she's pretty upset. Okay, maybe they were just really good friends. No, well, at first there was no indication of what was going on, but they were clearly a lesbian couple. You're yeah, right. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. We, we don't well, get first, that in this well, first first scene. Well, first I thought siblings, but no. I thought, like, actually, yeah. I typed this whole thing up with her dead sister, but okay. no, it was clearly later in the, yeah. you know. Okay, very good friends. <laughs> <laughs> we then cut to Flora, who is much younger, as her mother begs her to babysit young Kian. Their mother is off to pick up a birthday present, and their father is a stand-up comic. David gets a phone call. His wife has been in an accident and has been killed. Tora cries at night without her girlfriend there. Mailer visits his grandson's grave and cries. All right, so now we got three dead people. Mm-hmm. Three, dead, three families with dead people. Three setups. Suddenly, weird electrical disturbances happen all over town. Mailer gets a headache and passes out right on top of his grandson's fresh grave. When he wakes up, he hears something knocking underground. 
Thump, thump, thump. He grabs a shovel and starts digging. Grandpa's coming, he shouts. He gets to the coffin, and there's definitely knocking coming from inside. And he opens it. Elsewhere, Tora finds her front door open, and then finds her friend Elizabeth digging through the fridge. You're stone cold, dear. In the hospital, David notices his wife, Eva, moving around. And you noticed a nice detail before I did, too, when Elizabeth comes in. Um, her back is all She's wearing dark. this backless dress. Yeah, and you can see her back. It's where the blood pooled. Yeah, she's like black in the back and normal looking in the front. Because when you're laying on your back, the blood pools on you and it gets gross. Yeah. So these people are definitely still dead, sort of. Yeah, they're just walking around. They're mostly dead. (laughs) Partially dead. (laughs) So the doctors say Eva's heart is beating, but very slowly. They can't explain it. They've never seen anything like it. He goes home and doesn't quite know how to explain it to the kids. And we'll stop there. So... What do you do when your dead people come back to life? Yeah, and you can't move on, and they're not they're not gone, but not really here either. You know, yeah. And, yeah, and this does not seem to be a huge, full zombie apocalypse type thing. It's a very select few people are fresh, recently dead. Yeah, it's the fresh ones. There is a but scene where a you see that the cemetery ones. is getting real busy. Yeah, but this is not, it's not a world-changing over, event. The hospital is getting overwhelmed and not knowing yeah. what to do. They have, In fact, they eventually stop answering the one guy's call you know, <laughs> because they don't know what to do anymore, and they're so overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, but the, I mean, it's not like every dead person in the world is like back. It, it seems to be pretty exclusive. The fresh ones. Yeah. Yeah. Embalming is not as un, is not as common in Norway as it is in other countries. Well, maybe that wouldn't have mattered. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe they still would have come back anyway. So this yeah. is all really completely possible. Well, sort of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there has to be more than three families that this happens to. You'd think it would be all over the news. Well, in the in the background, it kind of is. And you kind of. And you see chaos unfolding around in the background. And But then the David goes on and, throughout the most of the film not knowing anything about what's going on. You'd think there'd be something that would be on the news. You'd think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's very bleak and atmospheric, or maybe that's just Norway for you. <laughs> I've seen complaints that the film is slow and boring. I didn't uh, think it was boring. No. no. I think it's just that the atmosphere takes time to build up. It's not a World War Z type action movie. This is a zombie drama. Mm-hmm. The upside down cross on the movie poster hints that it's all satanic or something. And that's just dumb. Yeah, I there's hate, nothing. I hate the design of that movie poster. There's nothing explanation. There's no satanic. There's no magic. We don't know why it happens, but there's nothing evil about it. And what it seems like is some kind of weird electrical surge or some natural event that's doing it. Cause yeah. it's a, we cause, really don't have any hints. Clearly everything electrical goes haywire. The power grid uh-huh. surges and they're hearing a buzz in the air, literally, from the electricity. And the old man passes out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but there's no comet. But there's no not, magic dust. We no, don't know. No, not satanic at all. I mean, no hints of it. Yeah. It's slow, and there's almost no action at all until right at the very end. But I thought it was pretty good. I liked it. Yeah. Yeah, I liked it. Just don't expect action. This is not an action movie. It creeps along. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. And then this one here, I, I wasn't expecting much out of this last one. You'll Never Find Me, 2024. Well, I went into this one completely dark, too. So did I. Just, you know, the, the movie poster doesn't look like much. This old bald guy in the rain. Yeah. <laughs> written or directed by Josiah, Josiah Allen and Indiana Bell, written by Indiana Bell. Stars Brendan Rock, Jordan Cowan, and Elena Carpetis. Hour and 40 minutes. And this is basically is two people talking. And a dark and stormy night. It is. It very, was a dark and stormy night. Very stormy night. Shutter original. Spoiler free. Me well, or who reads this one? I'll go for it. Go for it. With just two people in the small space of a trailer, this almost felt like it could have been a stage play at, at some points, I thought. Almost. Uh, like we said, it's a dark and stormy night, and we're left puzzling throughout what's going on. And if they are each who they seem to be. It's a strange one, but it's good, and we liked it a lot. Yeah. Basically, this is, entire movie takes place inside a mobile home with two people talking during a storm. Uh-huh. And it was very good. That's the majority of it. Now, there's one we're going to talk about next week, mm-hmm. The Abandon. Yeah. Which is two people talking on a phone for the entire length of the film. And, almost, and it was the most god-awful boring piece of crap I can remember <laughs> seeing all year. Almost all of it is just one guy that you see. Yeah. And she's a voice on the phone. 
We'll trash it thoroughly next week. But Pretty much. These are very similar movies, just two characters talking. They can do it right and they can do it wrong when, <laughs> yeah. when, they, when they do a single set, you know, limited cast like that. This is one where they do it right. Yeah, this one's good. Yeah. Well, we see that Patrick lives alone in a mobile home. Credits roll. Nothing happens. He's just sitting there alone, looking bored. And, yeah, he's sitting at a table with a. Bottle, he's got a little vial of something on the you know, table. And maybe he's going to take vial, poison. Maybe yeah, it's drugs. What, yeah, we wonder. We don't about know what's in that vial. Yeah. Suddenly, there's a knock on the door. He doesn't want to be disturbed, but the knocker is very persistent. It's pouring rain outside, and he lets the visitor in. She asks for a ride into town, but he says his car is broken down. And there's no buses at two a.m. The storm outside continues to rage. She says she was at the beach earlier and must have fallen asleep. Her bare feet are a mess, and Patrick finds holes in her story. He doesn't have a phone either. The payphone is way up at the front of the park. Patrick admits that he's paranoid, but that's because the people in the park like to play pranks on him. She starts getting creeped out by the older man, but it's still storming, and he notices something weird about her earring. He offers her... He offers to let her take a shower to warm up, but she senses a trap. This guy's probably a predator. She's nervous, but proceeds. While she's in there, she gets a vision that she's bleeding from a head wound. Afterward, he gives her a woman's sweater that he says used to belong to an old girlfriend. She asks what he's running from. Everyone's hiding from something. She talks about just coming from work, which doesn't match her story from earlier. So both... He's folks. a little suspicious of her because she's clearly yeah, lying. They're both a little off here, which makes us wonder, okay, what's going on here? Who's going to, you know, who's going to do what or, yeah. He <laughs> makes her some soup, but she suspects it's drugged and pours it in his boot, <laughs> which is a funny scene because he sees her do it. <laughs> yeah, he realizes it. But yeah, yeah, she's a young woman in this strange man's mobile home and he's weird. And she's alone in this isolated mobile home and this strange woman with a fake story comes in and. Who's going to kill who? Or, yeah. or is anybody? Or is it just awkward? It's nervous. It's that kind of thing. Uh-huh. Who's zooming who? And it is described as a psychological thriller horror on paranoia and gender power dynamics. That yep. sums it up that, very nicely. It does. Yeah. Old man, young woman, and they're both a little paranoid. Uh-huh. Why is she lying about everything? Why is he so creepy acting? The first hour is really good as the two characters try hard not to freak each other out, but they still manage to do it anyway. <laughs> it's about as low budget as a film can be, shot entirely inside a dark mobile home with mostly just two actors. And they do get into some effects and, and things. A little bit. Yeah. There was obviously going to be a twist or a surprise here somewhere, but I expected that the girl would be the bad guy, since that was kind of the opposite of what we'd expect. It's not exactly the way the whole thing works out. We do get an explanation of everything, and it all does make sense, but you do need to be paying attention to the stories that the characters tell along the way. Some of the stories start to drag a bit, but they all become relevant later. You do have to pay attention. And I thought the writing was really excellent. Yep, yeah. uh-huh. Yeah, which was an important aspect since it's just two There's of There's visually them. not much to it, <laughs> A big yes. chunk of it is just two of them talking. Yeah. yeah. I, it really held my interest throughout. And, yeah, I and I appreciated it a lot more after watching that other one that we're going to talk about next week. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that was just so bad. Yeah. It can be done good or bad, and this was a good one. Yeah, it yeah. was. You'll never find me. Yeah. All right, so on to our shorts this week. And who's in the back seat? It's The Devil's Passenger, the 2024. Devil. Written by David Bunston, stars Colleen Kelly, Gabriel Nybauer, and Will James Johnson. Four and a half minutes. Link to watch it in the show notes. What happens? Well, Lauren is on her way to work and stops at a red light. Suddenly, a woman pounds on the back window of the van in front of Lauren's car. Obviously, some kind of abused prisoner or something. Well, Lauren drops her phone and can't call for help, and the van's pulling away, and she doesn't know it, so she just follows the van. Except that doesn't end well. No. Yeah. Well, this is one of those films where we understand everything that happens, but we don't get any explanation as to why. It's well-filmed, well-acted, and nicely paced. It's also pretty short. But you kind of have to wonder why this is all happening. Uh, just because? I don't know. Because. It does. Because devilry. <laughs> yeah, it's good. 
All right. Well, what's next? I think I'm going to go with that as my favorite of the week of the shorts. Uh, do, 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 do. I'm not. Okay. Oh, okay. oh yeah, that's right. Baby fever is okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Uh, next up, we have Incursion, another new one from this year. Uh, directed and written by Ann and Kalkarni. Works for me. Okay. Stars Mena Rez Fritzky. Runtime is a short two minutes, 51 seconds. And, of course, it's available on YouTube. Sarah sits in her living room working on her computer when she gets a photo texted to her. It's a photo of her taken from just outside. Well, that's creepy when that happens. Someone's taking a picture it. of her from out. I hate it when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's no one there when she goes to look out the window, but then she gets a cryptic message on her computer as well. Then she finds out what's really going on. Mm -hmm. This could be a scene. I think we probably have seen this scene in numerous other movies. It's pretty well done, though. Yeah, I thought it was. Yeah. It's super short, less than three minutes, and doesn't explain anything. But it looks good, and it's mostly effective. The horror of technology. It's dark, but you can always see what's going on, and the acting is good. What did we watch just yesterday that was so dark we couldn't tell what was going on? Uh, the Lord of the Rings first the, episode. The first episode Season of Lord two. of the Rings, yeah. Yeah. Which was made for television, made for streaming television. Yeah. It's just like that Game of Thrones episode, Black Things Happen in the Black Dark. What are they What thinking? are they doing? I don't know. These are made for home television. And and it's not like we have a bad television. We have the no. latest. I was complaining about caveat yeah. earlier. That was an old TV. We don't have that problem anymore. Yeah. Well, this one, though, you can tell what's going on in the dark, and the acting you is can. good. I like that when that happens, yeah. yeah. Still, I'd like to have some reasoning as to why this is happening. Did Sarah do something? She just having a bad night? I don't know. Still, it's hard to go wrong with a three-minute investment of your time. It's worth it. So check it out. Next up, we have The Jogger from 2023. Written and directed by Daryl Denner. Stars Amanda Troisi, Michael Bullington, and Rodney Reyes. Seven minutes exactly. And you can watch it in the show notes. YouTube's got it. YouTube. What happens? Well, a woman is out for her regular morning run, notices a strange man sitting on a bench watching her. And she passes him quickly. And then she sees him on the next bench. And the next one. The guy clearly isn't running to catch up with her. He's just there. Poof, yeah. poof, poof. Well, to get away from the odd man, she takes a trail off into the woods where things get even weirder. Yeah, is this guy like some kind of stalker? What is his deal? Well, nothing bad can happen in a busy park on a beautiful day, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Except it can. Yeah, it can. This one's pretty good. There's no dialogue at all, but we get a clear picture of what's going on at the end. We don't know exactly who the what the mysterious man is all about, but we know why he's there and what he wants. I would have liked it to have been just a few seconds longer so we could see how the ending plays out. It's very good. Yeah, it was. I think of the bunch horror creepiness, this is probably the best of the five shorts, just its creep factor. And I think it, it does add an extra element to, you know, it's a bright, beautiful, sunny day in a park. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying it's my favorite, but I'm saying it's probably the best as far as just horror category goes. Yeah, it's up there. Yeah. Next up, I Adonis, 2021. Oh, it's old. Three whole years old. Oh, man. Written and directed by Angelo Rajmakers. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Stars Hein van Ruij, Dennis van Busekum, Yolanda Vandenberg. Yep. You might guess this North is Europe an international again. movie. <laughs> 13 minutes, 44 seconds. Tra uh, not trailer. You can watch it in the show notes. What happens? Well, Nicky had an unfortunate childhood. <laughs> his mother dressed him like a little girl, and all his friends laughed. And now little grown-up Nicky is a bodybuilder, trying to over overcompensate, trying to get past that, trying to be manly. Not going to pass for a girl anymore, but his body still isn't quite where he wants it to be. Well, bodybuilding is hard without the right diet. You got to watch what you eat. Mm-hmm. Well, body dysmorphia is a thing that drives people to all sorts of weird behavior. Nikki, though, may be a little over the top here. Yep, an extreme case. Otherwise, the short takes its time in building up the creep factor. I was starting to wonder if it was going to go anywhere, but it did eventually. Mm -hmm. It's well shot, looks good, and has an excellent cast to be in this story. He's got a bunch of bodybuilders in this thing, and he's clearly got the connections in the community there. Uh-huh. I don't think most of them were actors, but they were all just fine for this one. 
They got some big, scary-looking guys in this one, but yeah, they all do fine. Yeah. Not a lot of discussion, but it's good. Yeah, it was. It's unsettling, and yeah, I thought it was well done. Baby Fever 2022, and I'm pretty sure this is both our favorites. Well, I don't know. As far as shorts go. Yeah, okay. I'll I'll, I'll go along with that. Yeah. Written and directed by Hannah Mae Cummings, stars Helena Behrens, Lewis Llewellyn, and Georgia Thomas. 25 minutes long, so it's a long short. It's a long short. And you can watch it on YouTube, trailer in the show notes. What happens? And this had the production values of a full-fledged movie. Yeah, this was very good, yeah. yeah. This could have been a movie or a segment of a TV anthology or something like that. Yeah. It's 1972, and it's the week of the prom. Donna has plans to be prom queen, alongside football star Trip Baker. Her friend and sidekick, Brandy, is obviously jealous, but she's a follower. When Donna gives up her virginity to Trip in the science class storeroom, they don't see that they've released something unusual. Well, will she keep the baby? That's not an easy question in 1972. And the more important question is in her mind is whether or not the baby will start showing before prom. Which is silly because the prom's in like three days. Well, it's but a, it does it's, become an issue. It's kind of a silly horror, yeah. In biology class, when it's time to dissect a frog, that goes badly, demonstrating that the prom may be the least of Donna's worries. Yeah. It just gets worse and worse for Donna. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this one's a little slow getting started, but once it gets going, it really gets going. Oh, yeah. There were several laugh-out-loud moments in this one, and the ending is very rem- reminiscent of a different famous prom movie. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about. Yep. It's well-acted and shot. The sound and lighting are good, and overall, it's very professionally done. The special effects are maybe not groundbreaking, but they're completely fine for this story. That's practical effects. And the and the hokiness kind of adds to the humor in some places. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this one is really good. My favorite of the week. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll give you that. Yeah. yeah all right. So we're yeah. going to go with Long favorite Legs and Baby Fever. Yep, as our favorite. We're going to agree on those, okay? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is it for this week. Tune in next week where we will have five full-length movies and five shorts for you. Okay. New stuff. Like Mostly new. I don't know what they're going to be I yet. I like that. I know we committed to that stinker movie. You'd think that we're uh, approaching the Halloween season with more and more new, new films. New yes. films are out there. Yeah. Yeah, there's more stuff coming out than we can do in a week, which is unfortunate. That gives us stuff to talk about in November and December. Yep, it does. Carries over. And then March, we'll be back to the 1960s movies. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. And we'll see you next week. See ya.